Well, it's good to be with you again today. This is not a seminar, <laughs> nor is this an attempt to identify or elucidate all of the profound elements related to marriage, uh, but it is going to be part of our journey in going through the family of Abraham in looking at what lessons we can learn uh, from that story, and you cannot do that without looking at the marriage of Abraham. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge and appreciate the complexity of family dynamics, and that even the very topic of marriage can be painful for some. Because most of us have experienced at some level challenges, whether it was our parents or maybe close friends or maybe in our own lives, that no marriage has been perfect. And yet there are some beautiful and profound things I think God wants us to learn from this. So let me pray. God, as we enter into this time of worship, help our minds, our hearts to be open to your Holy Spirit. May you speak to us today, and may this place be holy because of your presence. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, here we go. <laughs> I think so, at least. My advancement advancer is not advancing. I uh, don't know if I did that or you did it. Let me try. Oh, that was me. Good deal. Excellent. The very best way to reform the character and regulate the conduct of your family is through the principle of love. It is indeed a power that, uh, that will accomplish. It is indeed a power and will accomplish that which neither money nor might can. It's really not complicated when you think of it. I mean, love is the answer, but what does that look like? What does that mean? How does that apply to our lives and to our marriages? Well, we're going to get into the story, and I like to introduce it with the, the kids' quiz. So um, I do need some microphone technicians to help out. Can we do black and yellow uh, to give us some sound here? We've got a trained microphone technician here. And a sound engineer technician here. Very good. Uh, raise your hands so that people at home, those that are watching, that's being recorded, can uh, hear and so everyone can hear. I, I see some hands over here. What was Abram's wife's name? I've tried to avoid saying it in the beginning. Shara. Yes, Vitor. Sarah. Sarah. And there's another name that she had, if you know it. Is that Eric over there? Go ahead. He's just stretching his arm. That's all it is. <laughs> okay, that's, that's all right. I'll go ahead and, and, and you got to, oh, I didn't see you, Benjamin. Sariah. Okay, you got it even before maybe I put it up there. I'm not actually sure how to pronounce it with the I. Uh, Sariah or Sarai or uh, something. Sarai. Okay, Sarai. Uh, there's a lot of ways it can be pronounced. We Principally, we'll call her Sarah for today's um, benefit. I don't want to uh, too mistakenly uh, mess up her first name, but that's her name. Her name was Sarai or Sarah. How old was Sarai or Sarah when she left Haran with Abram? How old was she? 65, 75, 85, or 95? We know this, by the way. We know how old she was, so this isn't a guess. Any young people? I see... I, I look elsewhere, but it looks like most of our young people are on this side of our children. Maybe I should say not young people, our children are on this side. Okay, is it back here? Um, 85? No, not 85, so we'll need someone else to help us out here. 65. Who said that? Delia, was that you? Oh, Okay. Did you know she's right? She was 65 years old. Now, I do need to say something about this. We often think, when we think of the story of Abraham and Sarah, we think of an elderly couple, 
We, did, we typically do. If you look at most of the artwork about old father Abraham holding baby Isaac, right? How old was he? This isn't part of the quiz. This is a bonus for you, okay? Um, wasn't he 100, right? And most of the time you see old father with big gray beard, wrinkled eyes, elderly, right? Because in today's world, someone who is 75, 85, 90, 100, they tend to be a little wrinkly and gray at that age, right? However, to be fair, people lived different lengths of lives back then. This is a long time ago. We're not too far from the flood when people lived hundreds of years. Abraham lives to be 175 years old. Sarah lives to be 127 years old. She probably even died somewhat young at 127. Abraham will outlive her by almost 50 years. Isaac will be 75 years old when Abraham dies. Now, what I'm getting by this is if you were to apply that lifespan to today's ratios, they would have been maybe middle-aged. Do you understand what I'm saying? Abraham was not a great, wrinkly uh, old man when he was 95 or 75 or even 100. He lived with the vitality and the humanity of someone who could live up until 175 years old. Is that fair? You may like that. You may dislike that. I don't know. But in reality, they're, again, if you were to apply their lives to our lifespans today, they're in their 40s, maybe early 50s. Is that does that make sense at least? Okay, you want to argue with me later, I'll sort it out and you'll, you'll find out why you're wrong. That's okay. No, I'm just kidding. I think that's a fair analysis when you think that lifespans were different back then. So I purposely tried to find a picture, not of old elderly grandma Sarah, but of someone who, even by today's standards, a, a marriage that's in their 40s or 50s, prob- and if they've been trying to have children and they've not had children, they're probably not expected to have children in your 40s and 50s. You can, and I'm not saying that's wrong, but if you've been trying for 30 years and you're now in your 40s or 50s, by today's standards, generally you're considered you're probably not going to have kids. You may have even given up by then. So the story still applies. Even though she might be by our standards middle-aged, the story of of their uh, not having children I think is still consistent But um, I just think it's good that we don't picture these people within a context and a culture that is wildly different from what it may have been like. Okay, number three. Oh, my clickety-clicker. See, when I start preaching, it breaks. (laughs) All right, what did Abram ask Sarah to do in Egypt? Do you remember this story? They go down there, and Abram has a special request for his wife. Do you remember? Okay, Dylan. Um, to pretend that she, uh, he's your sister. Wow, this young man, I tell you, that's right. Say that she was his sister. That was what he asked his wife to do. Very interesting. They're married, but he says, let's pretend we're not married. And we're going we're gonna to get into that story today. Uh-oh, I broke it again. So sorry. Oh, I'm just going to ask the question while they help us get it on the screen. The next question is, was that true or a lie? Was it true or a lie that Sarah was Abraham's sister? True or a lie? Okay, Eric, are you ready to... Str- oh, do we have someone over here? Oh, who is this? Young Mr. Isaiah is going to help us out with this. Lie. Oh, my goodness. That is... Well, you could say... You could say it was... Oh, see? Oh, my goodness. It was a half-truth, Right? <laughs> Sarah was a half-sister to Abram, and so Abram in his mind may have said, it's not really a lie. We do have what could be considered a, uh, a sibling relationship. I know that sounds weird by our standards today. We don't marry our siblings or even half-siblings and things like that, D- different things back then. So it was a half-truth, but did you know what a half-truth equals? A half-truth equals a full lie. A half-truth equals a full lie. All right, last question. I uh, don't know if it's me or what. Can we get to my last question? Oh, man. The question is this. Who was Abram thinking of? Eric, 
I haven't even asked yet. Dylan, you don't even know. It might be calculus. Who was Abram, thank you guys, who was Abram thinking of when he asked Sarah to lie? Who was he, who was he trying to help when he said, would you do this? It's going to be great if we do this. Was he thinking of his wife? Was he thinking of how this would affect uh, the Pharaoh in Egypt? Was he thinking of himself or was he thinking of what a blessing that would be to God? All right, I, I see the, the microphone up here. So uh, is that Luca? Lucas? Kyle. Kyle. Give Kyle a chance. I'm sorry. Sorry. Go. D. God. Was he thinking of God? Well, I think Abram might have been thinking that he was thinking of God, but I don't think he was thinking of God. <laughs> All right. Uh, Caleb? I see your hand over here. I'm trying to give ones that haven't had a chance Himself. Yet. I think Caleb's right. Were you going to say that, Eric? B. Okay. Well, well, now we're covering our bases here. I think Caleb is right. I think Abram was thinking of himself. I think Abram was thinking of himself, and we're going to show that in the story as we go along. Thank you, Mark and Toby, for helping out. Thank you for you young people helping us out getting into the story. All right. A couple of thoughts on, on marriage. The close and sacred relationship of God to His people is represented under the figure of marriage. Marriage is more than just a blessing and a gift and a convention for humanity. It is actually something God intends to be an object lesson and an example to us of His uh, love and intimacy with us. An unhappy marriage is the greatest calamity that can befall two people. Do you think that's true? You know, when you consider the possible relational dynamics. I think that's probably true. I mean, maybe it's slightly of an embellishment or you have to contextualize it a little bit, but I think it's easily at least arguable that an unhappy marriage can be the most devastating thing that you can face in a relationship. So, uh, that is a warning to us. The family tie is the closest, the most tender and sacred. I'm interesting that she chooses that word. She says it's the most tender and sacred of any on earth. And I think that on earth is, the, is, is what saves us because obviously our relationship with God is pretty sacred, isn't it? And that's kind of a, a heavenly dynamic, we might think. But outside of that, uh, I think it's safe to say that this is what Mrs. White is referring to, that the family tie is the most sacred of those that God has given us on earth. It was designed to be a blessing to mankind. That, that's, that's clear, right? God wanted Adam to have a companion. The one thing God said was a problem in the Garden of Eden was Adam was alone. And God, where's Vanessa? Vanessa, we were talking about this earlier. God exists as a community. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Without community, there is no relationship. So when God made humanity, he intended and planned that there would be built-in relationships because without relationships, we can't reflect the image and glory of God. And we are made in the image of God. So God gives us relationships. God gives us family. God gives us friends. He gives us children, all different levels and dynamics. But these are all designed to be a blessing to mankind, which is why the devil attacks them so much. It's why he won't leave our marriages alone. Why he won't leave our children alone. He knows that in these dynamics, God brings into our lives the glory and the salvation and grace that we need to be successful, and, and, this, and the devil hates it. It is a blessing wherever the marriage covenant, covenant is entered into intelligently in the fear of God and with due consideration for its responsibility. So it's sacred, it's important. A couple of uh, quotes I thought were interesting. My advice to you is to get married. If you find a good wife, you'll be happy. If not, you'll become a philosopher. Old Socrates there. Socrates. Very interesting individual. If you've ever studied or tried to study Socrates, uh, he's quite an enigma, quite a mystery. My husband and I have never considered divorce. Murder sometimes, but never divorce. I like this one. A happy marriage is the union of two good forgivers. Isn't that good? Does it work if only one is good at forgiving? It doesn't really. If nobody's forgiving, is that going to be a, a, a solution for a happy relationship? 
A happy marriage is the union of two good forgivers. I think that's good. We always hold hands. If I let go, she shops. Any young men? Boy, oh boy. So we come to Genesis 12, and as I gave in the introduction last year, God gave humanity a garden, a perfect garden, and in the context of that garden, it was unsuccessful to keep sin from spreading. Adam and Eve still fell into sin. So humanity develops into this violent race of people till we come down to the book of Noah, or excuse me, the book, the character of Noah. And God uh, gives Noah the plan to build an ark. And yet the ark also was unsuccessful in redeeming humanity. Yes, uh, Noah and his children are spared and they saved and the human race continues, but neither the, neither the Garden of Eden nor an ark of safety and salvation and refuge was the successful, eternal, uh, permanent uh, model that God knew the human race would need to restore the image of God within uh, the, the fallen race and give us the stability and strength that we need. In Abraham, God begins to develop a new model that has not changed from the time of Abram till now of how God wants us to, to, uh, to, to develop our walk and our relationship with one another, um, not just in his marriage, but through other stories of his family. So it's very profound when we get to the story of Abram and, or, or Abraham, I'm going to go back and forth with that, forgive me, um, because in this, God is really giving us the tool, not a tool, He's giving us the tool of how to understand divine relationships and the human ability to accept the mercy and grace of God. So in Genesis 12, the first uh, verses of Genesis are very encouraging. In this passage, Abram listens to God, Abram believes God, Abram obeys, and as he journeys to the promised land, he's setting up altars wherever he goes. Abram worships God. All of these, by the way, are basically synonyms of each other. You can't worship God if you're not listening to Him. If you listen to Him, you're going to obey Him. If you're going to obey Him, you're going to believe Him. So these are all just this, you know, different ways of saying the same thing. But the story starts out very encouraging, this faithful patriarch moving from the land of the Chaldeans, coming to the promised land, sojourning and traveling as he interacts with the people around him. But by the time you come to verse 10, God opens up a window into the life of Abram that becomes a permanent lesson for us uh, that we have studied before and we are going to look at again. Now, th- we've seen in the opening uh, of, of the, 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 the narrative of Abram, he is illustrating what it's like to be a friend of God. One of the beautiful titles that Abraham has given throughout Scripture is the only one that is called a friend of God. So he is developing this pers- close, close personal relationship with God. But that is not an excuse. Notice this, friends. A close personal relationship with God is not a solution or an excuse to neglect our relationships with each other. And this is what the story begins to open to us. This faithful, wonderful, believing, worshipful man comes into the story, and yet he still needs to trust in the grace of God. Now, I mentioned this last week, but I want to show it to you this week. The Bible makes it clear that the world which Abram lived in and the culture in which he comes out of was very different uh, than we sometimes anticipate. Thus says the Lord. This is from Joshua, the God of Israel. From ancient times, your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. Okay, I want you to notice this, that Abram was raised by and surrounded by a culture that embraced a world very different than our world today. The normal elements of the world were filled with idolatry. Slavery was normal. Polygamy, child sacrifice was the norm. When God called Abram, we're not even going to get there, but we all know the story of when God called Abram to sacrifice Isaac, right? And in our worldview, we say, that's crazy. How come he didn't rebel? How come he didn't say, God, that's not your plan? That's crazy. No, in his world, that was normal. It would have been expected, Okay, worshiping, having multiple wives. That was not strange. That was expected. Polytheism, spiritualism, hedonism. 
Okay, that was the world. Sometimes we get the idea that the Bible characters kind of walked around with a King James Version Bible in one pocket and all the red books in the other pocket, and we say, well, how come those disciples didn't know that that was wrong? How come those prophets and kings messed that up? Isn't it so clear? They lived in a world very different than we do. Now, I'll admit that some of these things are becoming much more part of our world. (laughs) We're kind of becoming more of that pagan world that Abraham lived in. But still, for a man to come along and tell his community, I worship one God, and by the way, he's invisible. They would have said, what kind of lunatic are we dealing with here? We know there's many gods. There's a God of the sun, and we've got his idol over here. There's a God of the moon, and the rivers, and the mountains, and the trees. No one was a monotheistic back then. This was revolutionary and new. And so it's just helpful for us to remember the world in which Abraham lived, the world in which his family lived would come to be in which God would begin to uh, illustrate these principles to us. So in Genesis 12, verse 10, we learn the story of Abram going to Egypt. Now we're going to get to it in just a second, but I want to just mention one other thing that's so important for us to realize. Not only do we need to remember the context of Abram and the world in which he lived, we also need to consider the context of who the generation was that was reading this story for the first time. Who wrote the book of Genesis? Moses, yeah, I heard it over here, Nico, loud and proud. Yeah, Moses, Moses writes the book of Genesis. He is known of what we call the Exodus generation, right? Moses the deliverer, taking people out of where? They are coming out of Egypt, and they're the ones, now, of course, when they're in Egypt throughout their generations, they probably maintained a certain oral tradition about their history and their ancestors, but it's clear that much of what they were back in the day had been lost during the period of slavery, and Moses is reintroducing them to the God of their fathers and the stories of their fathers. So I just want you to remember this when we go through the stories of Abraham, that the first generation to hear these stories in their Uh, in their totality as we have them in Scripture, is the Exodus generation. This is very important to understand what the whole meaning of these stories is. So I want you just to picture for a second the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, and and as they're journeying on their way, they come to Moses in the evening at the campfires as they've all set up their tents, and they say, "Uh, Father Moses, we want to hear more about our history. You've told us about Noah. You've told us about Babel. You've told us about how this our, our ancestor Abraham came out of the land of the Chaldeans. Tell us more about Abram. And Moses says, all right. You want to know more about Abram? I'm going to tell you. Do you know that he went to Egypt too? What? Well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Abram goes to Egypt, and because of his challenges and lack of faith, everyone is put in jeopardy, especially his wife. So here's the story. Now, there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt Yeah, that place you just left, that place of slavery, right? That's where he went. uh, Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. It came about that when he came near to Egypt that he said to Sarah's wife, See now, I know that you are a beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Now again, understanding Abram's history, his culture, this is what he expected. This is what people would do in the land of the Chaldeans. A, former, a foreigner comes into your land, and he's got some possessions. He's got some, some uh, women that look really nice. In a pagan world, in the world of the Chaldeans, they just say, all right, knock off the fella, take all the possessions. That's what Abram expected. That's the world he lived in. This is not hysteria. This is not paranoia. This is the world he anticipated and expected by when going from one center of civilization in the, in the land of the Chaldeans to the next center of civilization in, um, in, in, in Egypt. So think of it like this. If you had grown up in New York and God called you out, hallelujah, God called you out. No, I'm sure many good things are in New York and even in New Jersey, Edwin. But if you got called out of New York and you're sojourning in Idaho, Idaho, beautiful, beautiful Idaho, but then you got to go to L.A. You're probably going to anticipate that the things in L.A. as a big city are probably going to be at least somewhat similar to what you experienced in New York. That's just kind of an analogy. If it works for you, that's fine. But what Abram is saying is, this is what I understand. This is what I expect. This is the norm, and I've come up with a solution to this. Now, I want you to notice something here. 
uh, and, and this is a bonus, this is a little bit of a rabbit trail. The, the, the Hebrews love to brag on their women. There is ethnic pride in the scriptures when it comes to how it talks about their women. Abram is saying, and you can imagine the children of Israel loved it when Moses said this. When Moses said, oh yeah, our ladies are the best. All, even all of Pharaoh and all of Egypt are going to recognize that our Hebrew women, top of the line. Sarah is called so beautiful that people would kill for her. Rebecca, all right, uh, Isaac does the same thing with Rebecca when he's in the land of Gerar with Abimelech. He says, you're so beautiful, people will kill for you. So we got to come up with a plan. Rachel is called so beautiful that Jacob was pleased to work 14 years to be able to marry her. And even when he gets tricked with Leah, he still says, I'm still willing to work for, for Rachel. Esther is called so beautiful that in the entire realm of the Persians, stretching from India to Ethiopia, only Esther would be selected to be the bride of Ahaz Uwares because she was the most gorgeous woman in the land. Don't miss out on this. This is not, this is not happenstance. The Hebrews love to brag on their women. They love to see, say that our women are the most beautiful. I know that you are a beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, and then it's over for me. They'll kill me, but they'll let you live. And now i got a plan. Please, say that you're my sister. It's not kind of true, Sarah. Work with me here. Say that you're my sister, so that it may go well with me because of you, and that I may live on account of you. Somehow in his mind, he thought this plan would work out. Now, he may not have known what was going to come, but through all those faithful journeys, of, through all that wisdom and, and, and obedience that he had experienced after leaving the land of the Chaldeans and sojourning and traveling through the promised land, he, he finds himself at a crossroads, and he's unable to continue to trust that God has a plan that won't require him to violate God's law. Abram's faith faces a crisis, and now that which was intended to be a blessing in his life, he now sees as a problem. And this is where it begins. Sarah, I love you, but you're a problem. That which has been with me, that which God has given to me, I cannot see a way in which we can make this journey together in the way we, are, we have our relation right now. Sin does this in our relationships. It turns our blessings into curses. It twists our thinking. Rather than Abram saying, no, I know God has a plan. And this beautiful lady that he's given me, he's promised that I'm going to have generations of children. And that Sarah, my bride, will be the one to, that will be that. I know that God has a plan for my life. He falters. And he says, no, -uh, now we're going to a different place. And you're a problem. I'm sure Sarah loved that. Likes being called pretty, but probably didn't like being told, you got to lie. Abram leads Sarah into sin. Now, don't miss this, okay? This is so important. Again, the Exodus generation, the last family we read about with detail in the book of Genesis is Adam and Eve. Yes, Noah is there, but the entire narrative of Noah is the building of the ark. We don't even know Noah's wife's name, nor the names of his son's wives. We know they exist, but the purpose and the point of the story of Noah is not about the family, but the ark. The last family we have really interacted with in the book of Genesis, you've got to go back to the garden. It's Adam and Eve. And in that story, it's Eve that leads Adam to sin. But in this story, it's almost like an equalizer. God is telling the Exodus generation, don't just blame the ladies here, guys. They've made their mistakes. But in our grandfather Abraham's story, it's Abraham who leads Sarah to sin. So we're equal opportunity sinners when it comes to marriage. And now we have a marriage in deep trouble. They don't quite know it yet. They don't quite realize the full implication. But they're headed downhill in what is going to happen next. It came about that when Abram came into Egypt, the Egyptians saw that. Now notice this. The woman was very beautiful. Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. It doesn't say she was invited, does it? She was taken. 
Now, notice this in the narrative as, as Moses is inspired by the Holy Spirit to write it down. Sarah has ceased to be Sarah. She has ceased to be Abram's wife. What has she become? She's become the woman. This is a purposeful change in the dialogue. This is not by accident. She has now become the woman. She is now simply a female for the taking. Pharaoh simply takes her, and she's going to be taken several other times in this story. Okay, Again, this is the culture, this is the world uh, that, that they were in, in this paganistic world of, of, of uh, the patriarchy and everything else. If you want a woman, you take them in Egypt, especially if you're Pharaoh. But she's no longer called Sarah, and she's no longer called Abram's wife. She's simply the woman. That's what Abram did to her. Abram did that. You're not my wife. Don't tell anyone you're wi my wife. You're simply a woman. And a woman can be different things. Yes, you, I will say that you're my sister, but let's not tell anyone about our special, divine, blessed relationship that we have. You're now simply a woman. Therefore, he, Pharaoh, treated Abram well for her sake and gave him sheep, oxen, donkeys, male, and female servants. You want to know where Abram got Hagar? Right here. Where did Hagar come from? Right here. We'll get there when we get to Genesis 16. The, the story is not what Abram expected. He thought because of Sarah's beauty, his life would be in jeopardy. But in, in actuality, they were so excited that this new community had come in with these beautiful women and this beautiful, they're like, hey, great, we're going to bless you for that. So notice this, Sarah's put in danger. She has now become one of the ethnic, uh, ethnic uh, marriages within the harem of Pharaoh. She is not really shown to have any choice in this matter. She's simply taken into the household, and now she is both a sexual and a political tool for the pagan nation of Egypt. Is that what God's plan for Sarah was? So she is now in a very difficult position. Thank you, honey. Appreciate this plan. It's working out great. But Abram is honored. Abram's blessed. He's now richer than he's ever been before. Wow, more possessions. I'll give you a call every Saturday night, hon, but right now I've got all this extra gold I'm pretty happy with. But God is dishonored. And as a result, the blessing, back in verse 3, that God said, Abram, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your family. And as a result, blessings are going to come to the world through your family. But because of this debacle of a marriage relationship, the blessing has now become a curse. But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of now she's no longer the woman. The Lord is now speaking. The Lord is addressing this situation because of Sarah, Abram's wife. She's no longer the woman. She's now the individual. She's the person. She's the daughter of God. She's the wife of Abram. She's called by name, Sarah. And again, the Exodus generation, did they know a little bit about plagues in Egypt? They're listening to this and going, so old uh, grandpa, great grandpa Abraham, because of his issues, he introduced plagues to Egypt. Now, we don't know what those plagues were. And it's simply conjecture. They're probably somewhat consistent with the plagues of the Exodus. Oh, I don't want to get into it. Um, because the men of Pharaoh's house very quickly realized that something wasn't working. And they discovered that it was because of Sarah. She probably told them. Again, we don't know how. Pharaoh called Abram and said, what's this you've done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? She probably said, I don't know. It's, again, just simply... Uh, an estimation, why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. 
Sometimes you look at this story and say, well, why did God, if Abram and Sarah were the ones that, you know, originally sinned, why did God curse Pharaoh in his house? I think God was also trying to send them a message. You shouldn't go around just taking people. So he, it's not that Pharaoh is completely innocent in this story, in his house. I think there was a lesson for them to learn as well, okay? So they, they deserved at least a portion of this, but it says, now, here is your wife. Take her and go. And then... Maybe one of the saddest verses you can find in the Bible. Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they escorted him away. Have you ever been escorted away? Ever been told you're not welcome? You don't belong? Ever been fired from a job and escorted away? The family of God, the blessed father of the faithful, meant to bring blessings to the earth, is now being escorted away. You're not welcome. We, if this is your blessing, all it's resulting in is a curse, and we don't want any more of it. They escorted the promised family of God away. You think God loved the Egyptians? You think God loves all people? Do you think God may have intended and planned for this drought to be so that Abraham could come and be an ambassador to Egypt? But because of their inability to trust God, an opportunity for the gospel is lost. Now, don't forget this story. The Exodus generation hearing this, who has just exited Egypt because they've been slaves, now they're hearing how their foreparents were escorted away because they brought curses to those very same people. And an opportunity for the gospel is lost. You know, there's a motif in Scripture of the role of Egypt in salvation history. Abraham goes to Egypt because of a drought. Jacob and his family go to Egypt. Jesus Christ himself goes to Egypt to escape the wrath of Herod. God has illustrated multiple times his desire to save the neighbors and the people surrounding the promised land. And Egypt has always been there and always seems to be at a miss when God wants to use His people to reach them. And this is one of those first times. An opportunity for the gospel is lost because of this. Abram brings suffering instead of a blessing, all because Abram put himself before his spouse. He put himself before his spouse. He put his fears, his pride, his context and his culture before his spouse. He was willing to put her in danger, even if it meant he would live. Amazing. Is Sarah completely innocent in this story? There's a kind of a a misnomer about women in patriarchal societies. There were times, there are times that women were very much unable to do much. They were kind of like slaves, but that is not the norm. In most patriarchal societies, women still had enormous influence and even authority. Maybe not public civil authority, but women stand up and they have uh, an ability to influence the culture and community on a regular basis. Sarah could have said no. She could have. She could have said, this is not God's plan for us. He has been faithful with us since we left your father's house. He's been with us all these days and months and years that we have wandered in the promised land. Why would we turn our back on God's faithfulness now? She could have said no. In the New Testament, Paul instructs that wives are to be subject to their husbands as to the Lord. Now, does that as to the Lord make a difference? 
In other words, if your husband asks you to do something contrary to God, are you still to do it? I, uh, that, that was meant to be mostly rhetorical. The answer to that would be no, no. I just want to be clear on that before you leave. I want anyone leaving here wondering what I meant by that. Okay? You are first and foremost in your relationship to God to understand His plan for your life. That's why you should be so careful who you decide to marry. But even in, in, even in a marriage relationship, should there be a misunderstanding? And in your con- conscience and in your convictions, you find yourself at odds with, with what God's expectation is for your life has been clearly revealed in Scripture. It is your, your maternal, your wifely duty to call your husband to account. So I love you, but you're wrong. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. Did Sarah do this? She didn't. She didn't. And that was part of the problems. Of course, there's instructions for the husbands too. Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Did Abram do this? No, he did the very opposite. He said, I don't want to die. You're not worth it to me. I don't know what's going to happen, but all I know is I don't want to die. And if that means that you need to live by a standard and do something that's going to violate your conscience, let's go with it. And you look at this and you say, this is the family that God wanted to start really establishing principles with. They're a mess. That's right. They are a mess. And it's amazing what God can do with people who are a mess who mess up and need His mercy and grace. The story of Abraham is not about a perfect family. It's not about a family that always gets it right. It's about a family that struggles. It's about a marriage that struggles, but God sticks with them, and they learn lessons from it, and they become stronger for it afterwards. Abraham put self before God and his family. Sarah put Abram before God. And just as, as Adam and Eve's fall brought sin to the world, Abram and Sarah's sin brought suffering to Egypt. But God's mercy is ever-present and intervenes. God redeems them from that situation, though a great opportunity for the gospel is lost and would be Become a continual problem for the children of Israel, God's mercy intervenes. I'm going to just give a couple of, of closing thoughts here about God's ideal for us when it comes to our marriage. Marriage is more than a ceremony, a living arrangement, or a basis of child rearing. It's a holy and blessed gift from God for the purpose of happiness and demonstrating the power of God. It is a gift never to be embarrassed or shameful about. God wants our marriages to be reflections of His love towards us. Selfishness is the greatest danger to any relationship, but especially marriage. Especially marriage. God can and wants to heal and repair broken relationships and, yes, even damage marriages. A healthy Christian marriage, and I believe this with all my heart, is a miracle. If you try living with any human relationship on your own power, by your own wisdom, with only your own intelligence and strength, it's not going to be successful. It is a miracle that any two people can humbly, supportively dwell with one another. It is, takes the blessed creative, miraculous power of God. Let each give love rather than exact it. Cultivate that which is noblest in yourselves. And I like this part. Be quick to recognize the good qualities in each other. Be quick. Look for the good. Be quick to recognize the good in each other. The consciousness of being appreciated is a wonderful stimulus and satisfaction. Think of how the story would have been different if Abram came to Sarah and said, Sarah, you're so beautiful, and we're going into a different community, and I don't know what to expect, but one thing I want you to know is I will stand for you. I will stand for you, and though others may try to tear us apart, you are my wife, 
God has given you to me. You are a blessing from God, and God has called us to go into this community, and we're going to stand together. Would the story have gone different? God wanted to use a strong marriage to spread the gospel. God wants to use your marriage to spread the gospel. Sympathy and respect encourage the striving after excellence, and love itself increases as it stimulates to nobler aims. God is good, amen? Even when we're messed up, God is good. Even when we fail, God is merciful. Even when we don't reach His ideal, God blesses and God redeems and God wants us to grow into the relationships that He's designed for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's so easy to say on a platform, it's so easy to use a single illustration to try to identify these very sensitive and profound realities of human relationships, especially that of marriage. But God, I just pray that you would, whatever our situation, whether we're single, whether we're divorced, whether we've been married for 50 years or 50 days, that God, there are lessons for each of us to appreciate about your love for us and about how you want to pour your love into our lives through our family structures, through our friendship circles, and that each of those levels are opportunities to see your grace and to be representatives to those around us. Lord, we know you're coming quickly. We know you're coming soon. And Lord, it is our family relationships that will speak so much greater than any sermon can. We pray that you would help us in this endeavor because it truly does take a miracle for us to love one another. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.